the garden at her parents' Indianapolis, Indiana home. And her mother, Mary Ellen, and Father Curtis were likely proud of both their daughter and their garden alike. In the days leading up to the nuptials, the Indianapolis recorder rhapsodized about the Terry's garden. A beautiful rock garden in Lily Pond, bordered with flowers of variegated hues, against a background of saving junipers, oriental garden arbor vitae, Colorado blue spruce, Virginia glanca, blue junipers, Japanese cedars, and stately poplar, poplars will create a celestial atmosphere. The Terry's Garden lay in the heart of the city's near west side. In Indianapolis is roughly three hours south of Chicago. The city is part of an over the neighborhood was part of an overwhelmingly African American community that was routinely caricatured as a blighted or slum landscape. This image, for instance, was taken by an Indiana, Indiana University student documenting poverty in the near west side in 1960. There was indeed genuine impoverishment and material hardship in much of the near west side. And after World War II, a host of state and academic ideologues joined in a chorus decrying similar American cityscapes as slums to be targeted for wholesale removal. Nevertheless, African American cities were dotted with ornamental gardens that hearkened to southern rural traditions, provided imaginative retreats, and demonstrated middle class discipline and even raw affluence. The African American poet Ann, Ann Spencer, shown here for instance, had a large ornamental garden in her Lynchburg, Virginia yard, and she commonly deployed gardening metaphors in her poetry. Such African American gardens and experiences of nature illuminate the distinctions of African American imaginations of nature and rurality. Gardens were contemplative spaces that sparked an introspective imagination of rural beauty that retreated from racism and urban materiality and provided black gardeners a modest but critical power to shape nature in the midst of a social world often outside their control. In 2003, for instance, a memorial column for Curtis Terry cast his garden as a familial and natural retreat, suggesting that Terry's greatest joy was in providing a beautiful home for his family. He was a lover of nature. He was widely known among reputable nurseries and was known to have cultivated surrounding the beautiful family home, one of the most beautiful yards and flower gardens in the city. The memorial painted the home and garden as spaces of refuge, remembering that Mary Ellen Terry, quote, helped to make of her home a sanctuary where members of the family felt secure and happy. Rather than frame material things simply as public, other directed performances, gardens underscore how things were instead a soliloquy in which objects are intimate, imaginative, and inward expressions of African American expressive culture that inconspicuously express desire and confirmed human dignity. Gardens honed a patient rhythm distinct from everyday urban life. That is, gardening itself demanded patience with the seasonal pace of gardens' growth and flexibility in the face of the unexpected whims of nature. A garden was intended for viewing as a display of material and social discipline, but gardening was equally about the imagination of a natural ideal and an introspective medium without especially strategic ends. Nevertheless, to be ruled was to be Southern and evoke captivity and racism. So many African-American garden traditions were transformed by urban life, especially along class lines as ornamental gardens became more formally viewed as performative mechanisms confirming middle class standing. Gardens evoked a diasporan gardening heritage, but increasingly gardeners avoided rurality, black southern history, and racism. African American ornamental gardens were part of a rich African diasporan environmental heritage, and floral and food gardens like this one in North Carolina in 1939, have been part of African-American landscapes since captivity. Many African-American gardening traditions extended beyond captivity, and in some cases on the same landscapes as they transformed to sharecropping. In 1938, for instance, the Federal Writers Project interview in North Carolina described a former captive's little weather-stained cottage. Encircling her home are lilacs, althea, and flowering trees that soften the bleak outlines of unplanted, unpainted outbuildings. A varied collection of old-fashioned plants and flowers crowd 
the neatly swept dooryard. African Americans routinely exchanged or gifted plant cuttings and seeds, and particular plants materialized social relationships because they were associated with the giver. For instance, Alice Walker recalls that people coming to my mother's yard were given cuttings from her flowers. I hear again the praise showered on her because whatever rocky soil she landed on, she turned into a garden. Consequently, many gardens were vehicles of memory, evoking, evoking a heritage concretely linking gardens to family and friends. African-American gardening traditions were transported to cities during a roughly half-century mass migration of African-Americans from the rural South to northern cities between 1900 and 1950. Much of that gardening tradition was transformed by urban life, and there were clear transitions from an idiosyncratic individual experience of nature and rural heritage towards ornamental gardening as a social and class distinctive practice. By the 1930s, for instance, middle-class African-American gardeners began to form clubs that focused on ornamental gardening as part of women's domesticity. For instance, the Negro Garden Clubs of Virginia formed in 1932 with seven chapters, and a decade later, the organization had 65 chapters. The club placed among its core values home improvement, where the woman of the house has generally completely reorganized her yard in terms of nature's orderly patterns, combined with the landscape gardener's ideals of beauty. Yet they also aspire to improve race relations. Wherever a club has been established among the Negro women, the white women of the community have promptly offered their assistance in all phases of the work. Fourteen African-American women formed Indianapolis's Delphinium Garden Club in March 1938. And for 35 years, the club held flower shows, garden lectures, and social events. The women in the club nearly all hailed from bourgeois families and were focused on the pedagogical dimensions of gardening and the ways gardens confirm bourgeois discipline. Like most garden clubs, the Delphinium Club saw their mission to be fundamentally educational, aspiring to beautify yards and gardens in many parts of the city, especially among school children, by donating seeds and plants. Much of the club's unspoken focus was on the way gar flowers, gardens, and natural beauty could undermine racist imaginations of urban life. But many of the gardens that hosted club events and tours were quite spectacular, extending highly individual rural ornamental garden traditions to much more pretentious and labor-intensive social displays. In 1952, for instance, the Delphinium Club's annual flower show was held at the 528 Udell Street home of Ruby and Lenyer Rankin. The Indianapolis Recorder reported that the spacious yard itself was enough to make a complete show. Everything was in bloom. Beautiful roses were climbing over the backyard stone fence, which was centered with a running fountain topped by a statuette of a maiden at a well. And the garden pool was a real picture displaying the wide variety of fish, many of them given to Mrs. Rankin by friends. In 1960, the newspaper reported on another event at the Rankin home and reported that the Rankin flower garden, where an apple tree reflects in the pool and the fountain in the high stone well pours over a ledge into a bird bath, is one of the most beautiful in the city. Ornamental garden was, gardening was ideologically viewed as a woman's sphere, so garden clubs and gardening were testaments to gender discipline. Nevertheless, a few members of the Delphinium Garden Club turned their garden skills into livelihoods. For instance, the charter members of the Delphinium Garden Club included Dora Adkins, who took over her mother's flower shop in 1923 and managed it until her retirement in 1977. Dora Adkins was a Butler University undergraduate training to be a botany teacher when her mother died in 1923, two years after opening a florist shop in her house. Dora Adkins completed her degree in 1926 while managing the shop, and at the 50th anniversary of the shop in 1971, the Indianapolis Recorder noted that many other young designers have studied in Miss Adkins' workroom, making her early preparations as a, as a teacher in botany also a reality. The gardening boom may have been in the 1950s, when some of the Delphinium Garden Club's most prominent and wealthiest members moved to newly constructed suburbs, 
And in these new suburban settings, the gardeners routinely cast the landscapes as rural countryside. In 1947, for example, the club had its annual lilac breakfast event at the country estate of Mr. and Mrs. Henry L. Greer, the first of many African-American homes on Grandview Drive. In 1953, the club met at the suburban home of their, of their new president, Violet Reynolds, who with her husband David moved into a home a few doors away from the Greers in 1952. Stephen and Mary Otter moved into the neighborhood in about 1953, and in 1966, the club's 38th anniversary was marked in the yard park of two members, Mrs. Stephen Otter and Mrs. David Reynolds on West 64th Street. However, most of the garden clubs began to disband in the 1960s. In 1971, the Delphinium Club had one of its last garden tours when it visited two small jewel-like gardens. The 29th Street home of Frank and Lula White had a beautifully designed annual and perennial garden that is in bloom from early spring until late fall. The garden is bordered by rocks that encircle a velvety, velvety lawn spilling into the alley. They say they received their inspiration years ago when invited on a garden tour by the Delphinium House and Garden Club. <coughs> Frank and Lula White's 29th Street house still stands today, but the yard is today absent all the features the club celebrated in 1971. The interstate sliced through predominantly African-American neighborhoods included many of the former homes of post-war gardeners, including the Udell Street home of Ruby Rankin. The Rankin home where the Delphinium Club met in the 1950s and early 1960s still stands, and the stone wall of their lot still sits near the traces of a filled yard pond, but most of the garden's features have been erased. That's the guard pond, that's the pond right there, and that's the, uh, where the little statuette used to stand. The fate of Curtis and Mary Ellen Terry's palatial home and garden on Fall Creek was symptomatic of the urban transformations that erased African-American gardens. In 1941, Curtis Terry filed suit against the city because refuse dumped into the creek will cause the stream to overflow its channel and flood his property. Noxious odors in the neighborhood are often caused by a sanitary sewer located near the city hospital. And indeed, the city's combined sewer overflow system would flush raw sewage into neighboring Fall Creek during heavy rains when the sewers could not accommodate high volumes of rain. The Terry's home soon became part of a tract that was targeted for demolition by the city's redevelopment commission, even though it could not have fit the description of blighted. And the Terry's moved in about 1952 when their home became part of 178 acres that were raised during a massive urban displacement project. That's, their house would be right there at that blue arrow. Gardner certainly acknowledged the diasporan roots of African-American gardening but middle-class black gardeners were especially reluctant to recognize their practices were rooted in southern rural life shaped by anti-black racism. If you think back to the Terry's Garden, for instance, very few of those plants actually came from the South. Instead, th um, they referred to the ambiguous dimensions of natural beauty and avoided articulating the rural southern heritage from which African-American orna ornamental gardening actually sprung. Gardening may have been especially appealing to African Americans because many of the vagaries of nature were apparently colorblind, with every gardener subject to the same basic ecological realities and insulated from the fundamental anti-black racism structuring market space. The pleasant but largely unexpressed distraction of gardening is difficult to articulate ar archaeologically. The landscape is methodologically challenging to assemble, and the historical observers of ornamental gardens misunderstood their consequence as prosaic everyday toil in which the process of gardening was perhaps more significant than the product. Despite these challenges, gardens and much of everyday African-American consumption secured much of their significance from the elusive refuge of imagination, reflection, and interiority. Thank you. Thank you.